Get ready, you've got a big one coming up this episode. I'm gonna be talking to you guys about graffiti, street art, and jail time. My name's Doug, this is Fifth Wall TV. Before we kick things off, if you don't already, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and follow the page. All that stuff makes sure that you don't miss out on any content and it helps me look like some people are actually watching these videos. Anyway, a couple of weeks ago I caught the short film More Hate Than Fear by Molly Walker and thought it was about time I started this conversation myself. The short film was a follow-up to a documentary of the same name which looked at prison sentences for graph writers. So for this episode, I'm going to be looking at how the judicial system views graffiti culture and what we can do to push things forward. This episode's broken up into a couple of different sections. I'm going to cover as much ground as I possibly can. Let's kick things off in 1980s New York. Oh, somebody let me know. Put everybody in the place, put a whistle in your face. Scream it out and say, yo, hey. Graffiti in New York in the 1970s and 80s is the stuff of legend. I'm going to dedicate an entire video to this later on in the year, but for now, I want to take a look at the state's reaction to the explosion of the scene and how this essentially shaped the culture's history. It's my personal and virtually undocumentable feeling that this is only going to, again, cause people to say, well, gee, look at that design. I can do better than that. And they're going to try. And that's what we don't want. In really simple terms, graffiti as we understand it today was a reaction from inner city residents, predominantly young guys, who felt neglected and abandoned by the limited options that they had in front of them. By putting their name up around different parts of the city, they were able to build reputations and get respect from their peers. Quite simply, graffiti boils down to identity. You know, you go, it's called going all city. People see your tags in Queens, uptown, downtown, all over. <laughs> In the eyes of the state, graffiti was an act of defiance that made local authorities look weak because they were unable to control it. In 1982, psychologist Wilson and Kelling birthed the phrase broken windows theory. The idea that if you have one window on a property left broken, everybody walking by will think it's okay to break all the other windows and they'll all become broken. So in society, a broken window was graffiti. And if you allow graffiti to exist, everybody will think it's okay for crime in general to exist and that will lead essentially to everybody just running about killing each other. How this actually plays out in reality is still up for debate, but what does matter is that broken windows theory paved the way for the future of how governments were going to tackle crimes such as graffiti. In a citywide crackdown, agencies such as Ghost were set up and the war on graffiti begun. Now the artists were risking more than ever to get up. Train stations were secured with razor wire, guard dogs were being put in place. Every single tag was being documented and recorded so when you were caught for one tag, they would have an entire backlog of everything else you've defaced. In 1983, a young black man named Michael Stewart was essentially beaten to death by cops simply for tagging his name on a train car. This is the incident that actually made Basquiat quit graph altogether. Now let's take a look at how the system works today. In the UK, a young offender can be looking up to about two years with adults stretching all the way to 10. Cases of young offenders seeing the inside of prison cells is showing absolutely no sign of slowing down. In one of the biggest cases of unbridled hypocrisy, it's time to look at London in 2012, when the city played host to the Olympics. The Olympic Stadium was constructed in the east end of London between Stratford and Hackney Wick, both predominantly low-level income multicultural communities, but with Hackney Wick being one of the UK's biggest artistic communities. So here's what happened. The area known for cheap rent and all kinds of art was now the epicentre of the world stage, and the local government were taking no chances at letting a couple of kids with cans ruin their glowing reputation. For miles, bits of street art and graffiti that had been in place for years was now being buffed out. More seriously, artists that were once officially invited to paint the athlete's village were having their homes raided. Their computers and mobile phones were being confiscated. They were getting barred from using public transport, holding pens, holding cans, and going anywhere near the Olympic Stadium. 
suddenly the government was flexing this authoritarian muscle and it was really affecting the lives of dozens of artists. At the same time, tourism in Shoreditch and Spitalfields was booming. Groups were coming from all over the world and paying top dollar to go on street art tours and learn about Shepherd Ferry and Veal. In the centre of Spitalfields Market, they erected an information point plastered in pictures of Rolla's artwork, brandishing the words, Welcome to Brick Lane, home of the UK's street art. If you weren't already seething with anger at this hypocrisy, things are about to get very dark very fast. To me, it just seemed like madness. Like, I'd be in the same kind of educational courses as people that had murdered their wives and they'd done 28 years in jail. They were 55 and they had no life because by the time they'd gone in jail and come out, all their friends had died. And it made me think, like, fuck this. Like, I'm nothing to do with these people. When a graffiti artist goes to prison, they suddenly find themselves in an environment where they're surrounded by armed robbers, murderers, rapists. It's not even the same for a street artist. When Invader was caught a few years ago in New York, he had a night in the cells. But when 23-year-old Tom Collister was caught, he was handed a 30-month sentence. Four months into that sentence, he hung himself. In 2013, Vamp was handed a three and a half year sentence on the same day that BBC presenter Stuart Hall was given a 15 month sentence for sexually abusing girls, one of which was nine years old. Every single person watching this video just now will know the difference between tagging on something and sexually abusing a nine year old. They aren't in the same category. It comes down to how we view the people doing this and the culture from which it exists. I was up in London, we were tagging up on Trafalgar Square. Not the brightest thing to do. This copper seen us. PC Fat Nigel, that's what we called him. And um, he chased us for, oh my God, it was like for ages. We basically, we lost him, but he flagged, he, like, he, he called in for backup. We got put in separate cars and taken to um, Bow Street Magistrates. And then the British Transport Police drove up to London, picked me up, because there was a warrant out for my arrest and, and drove me down to um, Bristol. Just slight waste of, you know, taxpayers' money, completely. When newspapers like The Telegraph and The Sun are throwing around labels like graffiti attack and gang, but at the same time celebrating a new Banksy piece, it shows a complete lack of understanding of where this entire culture comes from. You can't put one man on a pedestal and another in jail for the exact same crime based on the fact that you don't get it. Graffiti was never something for the masses. That's part of the reason that the letters are manipulated like that. But with governments and corporations making an increased presence of appropriation and curation within the culture, it's important to remind ourselves that there is a very fine line that splits something that's accepted and something that's not. And when it's not, it's real repercussions for these guys. I think the sentences that are laid down to artists are completely out of uh, perspective with what the crime is. Uh, for just, you know, doing something creative or even if it's creative vandalism, it's uh, damage to property and it's not damage to the person. Really, it could just be put into community service or made to go and paint stuff over. I'm never going to sit here and say that I believe all graffiti should be legal. If some guy comes up and draws a wobbly willy over my shop front or my car, I'd like to know that the state has my back in that instance. I understand why it's illegal to paint on the side of a train but not for a second do I think that it's okay for some kid to have his life pulled apart and pushed to the point where he sees suicide as the only option just because he defaced a bit of property. As we implement mural festivals all over the world, councils and states need to be more proactive in how they engage with this at a grassroots level. Legal wall space is a great way for artists to be able to practice their skills in a safe environment. And to be honest, they should be as common as inner city skate parks. At least if some kid's gonna tag your wall after that, it's gonna be slightly better. But more so, there has to be a systematic adjustment as to how graffiti artists are viewed. Not as hardened criminal overlords, but just as people that see the world different to everybody else. Prison sentences will never eradicate graffiti and are as much of a burden to the taxpayer as any cleaning costs. Community service is surely more than enough to pay your debt back to society. But moving forward, why not look at mural projects with schools and youth centres and try and catch people on both sides, the past and the future, and engage with them and maybe open up new opportunities. It just feels like not enough is being done to explore these options before people start throwing kids into jail cells. Let me know what you think in the comments section. My name's Doug. This was Fifth Wall TV. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you like the page, subscribe to the channel, share it, tell everybody.